All right, with 150 people, this is phenomenal. And I'm gonna open the proceedings on Zoom by just um, acknowledging that Canada has a long and not particularly pleasant colonial history. And so we should thank and recognize uh, the indigenous people who were here before us and recognize that Guelph is on the ancestral and treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the credit. And now I'd like to pass over to my colleague, Dr. Derek Haley, who will introduce the talk today. Thank you, Dr. Mason, and hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to you from those of us at the Campbell Center for the Study of Animal Welfare and also from the Saputi, Saputo Dairy Care Program here at the University of Guelph. Uh, this week here at Guelph, we are running a rotation for final year veterinary students uh, in dairy cattle welfare. And we wanna make a special welcome to those students joining us uh, today from OVC, from the Western College of Vet Medicine, and also from the University of Montreal Vet School in St. Hyacinth. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce to you today, Joao Enrique Cordoza Costa. Dr. Costa is an assistant professor at the University of Kentucky, and he leads a research program there focused on precision dairy farming, dairy cattle nutrition, management, and welfare. Dr. Costa completed an agricultural engineering degree and a master's degree in his home country of Brazil before moving to Vancouver, where he completed a PhD degree at the University of British Columbia in their animal welfare program. Joao also spent some time there as a postdoctoral fellow before taking up his current faculty position at the University of Kentucky in 2017. And Dr. Costa has been investigating the effects of early life in calves development in dairy calf management and nutrition, looking at group housing practices and the use of precision technologies uh, and using those to make managerial decisions uh, based on data. And as you can see from uh, his title slide, he is going to be talking to us today about dairy cattle behavior in modern production systems. And he asks a question, are we forgetting about calves individuality? Dr. Costa, we're really looking forward to your talk and thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Derek, George, and everyone at the TC South. And it's an honor to be here. Very glad and very glad to see so many people actually. This is a new talk. I put these slides together, hopefully. If at some point, uh, you know, any question arise as well, please. I think like we're going to have a Q and A at the end, but like I will kind of monitor the chat and things like that. And I will definitely uh, answer any question you may have. And yeah, I tried <laughs> in the end, I gave the title and then I start to put things together and was too many and then it reduced, put back. And I think I tried to make a cohesive history here, but even before talk about any of the research, I will straight up say that I stole a lot of it from my last three students, my last three grad students that worked somewhat with this. Um, Melissa Cantor in the left, Megan Setzer in the middle, and Emily Mikowski, that are three of my last grad students here that work in this area. And I will be showing a lot of the research, but also I would like to acknowledge that a lot of these, even my own research, but a lot of Heather's new research that I will show here that we did together at UBC, that it all, where it spark, all the research that I brought with me, I brought the ideas, I brought things that I'm doing here at Kentucky, and I would like to acknowledge that. So what I will be trying to go through and talk today is that idea that obviously, and I literally had the whole background to talk about personal traits, how we define what the research has been doing. And then yesterday I realized that I had a hundred slides. So I deleted 90% of that. And it's, I will just accept that all of you have the background and the knowledge and the understanding that animals have personality traits. And I'll talk a little bit about that, how we go through in research through that. But I will bring that idea that we can use precision data technology and how we can use it to try to measure and use that information to manage animals. 
So talk about how to uh, measure it, and especially that relationship. I personally, I don't like to that. Normally, everything just has a value when it's related to performance. But this is one of the places that is related to performance, and I think we can use it uh, to to inform the modern production system that we have. And then I'll talk a lot about the future application because literally it ends in a point that, yeah, great, we can measure, we can do this and that, but what to do in the future is a big question. And I will try to bring a little bit of that at the end. So just as a, a very short background, I think personality trait research has been going on like the first few papers started on the late 20s, early 30s, especially with chimpanzees, a lot of descriptive uh, work. I think most of us have seen even colloquially, even on the common uh, literature, some of this description. I like to joke with my students when we are like, we go through all this research and make them do a literature review of that. But in the end of the day, we normally talk about the dogs that they have at home, the, the difference between the birds that they have seen, the cows at the farm. And I think that is like, you know, there is a formal research associated to it, a lot of very classic definition, but we also have a connective, a connection to animals that uh, give us that, uh, that perception. It's seen across the species. Obviously, we have this uh, phylo hierarchy, right? That closest to we are the most complex. So you go down to a little, to li little to little uh, down the path, down the pyramid of the species. But nowadays, I actually was just like looking a very cool paper about personality in chameleons the other day. That is super interesting how they forage and especially how that is associated with the personality. So this is uh, spread across and we have a lot of research and even, and I like to talk about that because even the Caro research on personality derives straight from the rodents. So the rodents that I use more often in those, uh, in those studs and what we know the most were like a lot of even our own uh, psychology and especially the medicine and the medications associated with mental health comes from a lot of these tests. We, we draw a lot of our experimental methods from them. And I will talk a little bit about that and especially the limitations of that and what we can do moving forward. So there is many names, right? I will, here I will call straight up personality traits. I will call the traits. I will not, in, not even have the time to explain the traits uh, that we will discuss. I will just show, and I, will, I try to have like the papers there, a good reference. Even I copy and paste yesterday, I made a pro, uh, print screen of some of the papers. Just if anyone has more interest in, detail, in the details of the personality traits that have been used and discussed, uh, you can go through. But we call it colloquially temperament, behavioral characterization, coping styles, behavioral syndrome. And many of those have limitations, um, definitions that are somewhat different, but at the end of the day, they describe some of the same. That is that idea that the personal traits of these animals have a difference between them. So each of the animals uh, will have its own personality traits, or at least the expression of them. Those traits are consistent across contexts, and those traits are temporally stable. And I will try in the last 10 minutes or so with a, a few of our papers, try to convince you that even calves and cows uh, have like very consistent personality traits because that's the base, right? If they didn't have very consistent personality traits and they express those personal traits, we couldn't measure and we couldn't use that to manage animals on farms. So even that little calf that is two, three, four months old, it's already expressing very specific personal traits. We can measure it and it's consistent across time. And I hope that you know you believe me, but we <laughs> we tried and uh, tested it very very much throughout. So here we have two calves, right? The calves in the left now. That is the uh, 
let's say the most, I will not call afraid, but a calf that is very attentive and not having any relationship with this novel human that is there. And in the right, we have the calf, right? That is very bold. I'm not saying like there are more to it and I will explain, but it's very clear the individual difference. And everyone has walked in a calf barn, has walked uh, in a dairy farm and have seen those differences, right? Those calves were raised at the same way, at the same age, and they are coming in for the same test. And the difference between them to the response of their novelty, it's clearly to totally different, right? You can watch this for 10 minutes and it will be one pretty much beating the researcher that is there and the other one watching freezing from far away. Just like a more scientifically showing those difference, uh, you can see here, right? The total time spent in Tauchia, novel human in a test goes from those calves here that are like, freezing in the corner, like, I don't know, like losing that thing, right? Oh my God, who is this guy that is here? What is this? Why I'm here by myself? And freezing to the other guy that literally is the nightmare of the poor intern that we came in cough room and say like, you need to come in now and sit on the test with us. That takes like a beat for seven minutes of a calf that is 80 kilos. So that difference is obvious and exists. So much that when we are developing, and I'll talk a lot about some of the new tests that we are developing. One of these was that adaptation from the sheep world on a isolation box where we put calves in this isolation box. And I will talk a little bit more about that. The first thing that we did is like, let's do a pilot with some calves because we need to see difference. If we want to see if that test is related to any of the personal traits. And obviously when we do that, we have that crazy difference from the calf that pretty much like goes inside of the dark box and freezes there, don't do anything to the one that like literally we thought that the box would be broken, right? So that individual difference is what we expect. And that's like a measure of that personal traits that we are trying to measure. So calves are different. That is the take home message and they behave different in regards to novelty, in regards to some of these tests. The second one is like, are they consistent through time? So we do that test when they are 45, 50, 60 days. Are they consistent through time? Maybe that is just like that day, something happens, something uh, goes on. We did a lot of re tests, retests, and they are consistent. But I really like this paper that we did uh, where with Heather especially, took us like two and a half years to do this test, or even a little bit more, where we tested the calves at pre-weaning, at post-weaning, at just breeding age, and then just uh, six months after they calf. So we did that throughout. Uh, Nelson, our manager at the time, cool a lot of our heifers, and we tried to, we lose some of the animals throughout time, but like we end up with a very consistent uh, sample size. And we did the same test throughout, like, novel environment, novel object, and human approach, where these animals would be all by themselves on the novel environment in a new test, in a new test arena for 30 minutes, would be there with a novel object uh, for 15 minutes or with a human that they never had seen uh, from for 10 minutes. And here was a good thing, right? If you were the guy that came when they were pre-win or post-winning, you are lucky, but the even the people that came when these were animals in the milking parlor already, 30 months old cows, actually was a safety concern. And I'm really thankful for Stephanie that did that for us. And I will, one thing that we do with this test, I don't have the time to go through in details, but you extract some of the similarities that happen throughout the three tests, all the variables that are collected, and pass through a PCA uh, analysis, is a, a type of cluster analysis where you extract some of the similarities of five to 10 uh, indexes that will become, well, one to three factors, one to four factors, depending some of the, the definitions that I use. And those factors normally, I group, like they group a lot of the 
of the behavior that are seen on those tests. Very similar, like, and you hope, right? Like, you know, talk later, the other one that is uh, hopefully similar across contexts, but generally a very strong PCA and is one of the tests that is done to the PCA is that it's group behavior that are similar. So here we have three, uh, three tests. All the three tests have a behavior that is attentive to the element. You hope that those three behaviors go together from the three tests in the same factor. And then you are able to that variation that you explain, extract some of the factors and the loadings that come from the species. Just one detail, because I will show this literally forever until the end of my talk, is that we pass it through a very max rotation. It uh, makes the factors that are extracted and the loads that are extracted of the PCA um, normal distributed and especially normal distributed in this range of minus three to plus three. So minus three is that load is uh, highly non uh, significant or highly negative. So less and less of that happen in that factor and plus three is that that is the max, right? So if a load is fearful and has uh, avoiding the object and is a plus three, that means that that animal was the biggest one that never thought the animal never got close to it. So we did that. We did this test of the calves when they're pre-wind, post-wind, uh, breeding age and lactation. And we passed them through the PCA and we compare the times where they associated is that a they behave similarly in the test throughout time. And we found that yes, the loadings that we extract of the PCA for both explorative, active, uh, are, highly, uh, are highly related in the regressions. However, actually we found that during the puberty and lactation, they were not associated. But however, throughout most of its life, was highly associated. And obviously, when the media gets paper like this, it goes and say like, oh, cows go through disruptive puberty, right? But it's not that, it's a true time. And I just want to point out that one day in our life, we are like, cows personality was more important than the coronavirus, right? That is like, oh my God, coronavirus is coming. Who knows what is that? Big cow personality, right? And but the point is that very interesting is very related across time, super stable uh, throughout. So it is different between animals. It is consistent through time. What about context? What about like if we do things different and also I always been, when we started to do this like now in 2016, 17, my Every time we were there all together, putting together the arena, putting together the cameras, the people, my point was always like, yes, this is very important. It's super interesting that we know what's going on, but does it relate to what the animals do in a more daily life? There's more, what about feed? What about other uh, factors of their life? And we did that. We did the same thing coming back to the same test. I'm even using the same photo, but it's all new papers. We did the same three tests for these animals. We track the loads from the PCA. Actually, these loads are very similar uh, to the one of the other papers. And I was interested, like, do these animals with, or better, does the personal traits that we extract from traditional uh, standardized tests related to the relationship that these animals have with feed. And we had this, we also extract the test from a PCA, but we had this idea, this expectation that the fatty, right? The cow that was super like, I'm bold, I will eat anything, I will go some like novel feed there as, as we were presented, wouldn't care, wouldn't be having any avoidance of the new food the fatty cow would be the one that would relate or translate to the lack of fear in the test that we did. That was the expectation actually has even a lot of um, anecdotal suppositions of that on the literature and even other species. And we didn't find that association. 
we did not find it like they neither with curiosity or explorer, exploration in the test, neither with both. What we found was this like very interesting association with active. So animals that were like super active, never froze, were never uh, interest on the in the novelty, but uh, were the ones that end up eating. And now I, I would just want to point this out because this will come back many times between that personality trait of active during the test and this feed rela relationship with feed relationship with other tests and was completely different from when they, the ones that didn't eat but inspect were very curious about the feed that we presented. But I was not happy. I was like, but is it like, it's just that what is going on? So when we were doing another trial, just now actually, I actually ended up being published yesterday and I didn't change the reference, came out yesterday, some of this discussion. I wanted to see what was the relationship of these calves when they were learning how to eat in the, in the group housing the personality test that we were developing at the time, the isolation box test, and if there was any relationship across context of those personality traits. And we did that, we tested the calves uh, again. Just here I'm introducing a new test instead of the uh, novel arena test, what we did was a startle test where the calves were put together with an umbrella through a hole in the arena. When they thought that umbrella would open, the calf would obviously get startled. And then from that moment we would count the behaviors that would come. If they would uh, hit a uh, touch again, the umbrella, it, what it would do, and that was also put into the PCA. And we did the isolation box test. That is a test that we left the calf inside of the box for five minutes. This box had like very well technology attached five hobos throughout some load cells at the bottom that end up not being used because the hobos around like on the top, top back and both sides and in the back of the box would measure the agitation of the animal inside. And what we did was uh, the variation of this axis. We calculated a total movement index that is the sum of the logarithm of all these uh, axes, or the five axes, or the three axes per hobo, and all the five axes to create this total movement index. The TMI is not too much information, but too much uh, like total movement index. And we calculated that for every animal and wanted to relate that. So that association first between this novel test, the, iso the isolation box with the person, the traditional or standardized personality tests. And what we found actually is that we were expecting again that the fearful and the bold were highly associated with the total movement index and it was not what, uh, what it was associated with again was how active or the behaviors, uh, the behaviors that association with the animal being movement inside of the personality test with the total movement index. Again, the same uh, across context that we found with feed. And this is, well, bad and good news at the same time, and I'll show you why. So these calves are different. They are stable through time with their personal traits. And it's really these personal traits are very uh, associated across context. And there are many other, I'm just showing my research, right? There's many other papers and studies looking at that. However, the problem is, is that I imagine me showing up in Texas, Amarillo, Texas in a two weeks in high plane nutrition and say that every cow in their barn has to be put on an isolation box test for five minutes. Everyone has to watch, download the hobo, go through a process to find this, right? This is completely non-doable at the point in time that we do. Worse, if we ask them to go there and do personal tests where they put them on an arena. So we start to discuss that, that we have terrible, um, traits that are measured now in the industry, like the milking temperament, 
uh, adaptability to milking that is completely qualitative scores with no relationship whatsoever when we test with personality trait. We have in other industries a little bit better scores, but nothing like <laughs> a shadowing, right? Like shoot scores, back tests on, on swine, isolation box tests as we, we discussed, the one that we are trying to adapt uh, to calves and work actually very well. But that opportunity of measuring it is still out there. And when we, we started to discuss in this, I'm like, and I know that Dr. De Vries there in Guelph had some of similar ideas. Why we don't use this precision technology device that we have in every animal, measuring their behavior on a daily basis throughout their life to see if it was associated with personality traits. And precision data technology is used for a lot of things. And more and more, we are discussing that idea of can we phenotype, like, can we profile these animals based on their daily patterns of behavior? Or if we want to even make that leap, we are not ready, in my opinion, to make that leap. But can we use precision data technology in the future to profile personal traits, at least uh, some of those personal traits in these animals? And that's what, like, that inception of research is what I'm going to, to talk about now, but there's a lot more questions than, uh, than answers there. And we did that. So these animals that I just talked about that we follow literally daily, their behavior, what, what they did, their health. We did person, traditional personality tests. We did food neophobia. We did everything that I could think of. And my 40 students were not going to jump from a bridge doing for in two years in like a very big set of calves. And these calves are monitored by a pedometer, by an automated feeder, by a collar, and actually how much they use a brush. Uh, but I will, I will not show this data now. And we have all these variables, right, of these animals, and we try to associate. Is there an association between the personality traits that we know and these calves' like daily behavior? And we actually found some, we found some with the traditional personality test that I will not show here, but even the simplest one of them all, like what they do in a daily basis is highly associated with the index that we find from the box. And even like one thing that happened here is because we tested so many things that our uh, stats lost so much power and we got a lot of this uh tendencies that uh, we are really trying to explore more because we saw this highly related to a very simple test or even the personality traits and uh i think that is a lot of like a lot of possibilities uh for the future but one thing that we always are uh, interested on is that these calves have to transition through from a a liquid diet to a solid diet. And how do they do that? Where do they learn? How they learn? What they eat? It's fundamental. And normally I like to talk that we always look at numbers from many calves, but I like to focus on each of them that are there because the welfare of one is, is not like non-influential by the welfare of the mid of the group, right? So I think it's interesting that we can start to tailor the individuality of this animal. And we did that, like just the, I brought the one that I always like to talk about this paper because I think it's super interesting because these calves go there every day and have to make that decision between milk and grain. From day one, they learn where it's one and two and they will have to be doing that throughout their life. And by day 60, we hope that they are very into the grain because if not, they will struggle through that process of winning. And when we look at the animals, this is perfect, right? This is like some of our papers looking at calves that what at that time we thought was the best weaning method that we could. These calves drink 12 liters per day, were weaned on a step down uh, at day 38. Three weeks later, they were gradually weaning. So if we look at the grain intake of the average, that is the red, is this perfect line, right? Textbook 
many Mike Steele would be like, oh my God, your calves are doing super well. However, the average doesn't tell the history of need the, the top ones here that even day 26, 20, were already eating and a lot of grain or doesn't even, unless it tells the history of these four guys here, the slow learners that like they were already drinking half of their allowance and then the day that we literally took all the milk was the first day that they're like, oh, maybe now we need to eat something if to not starve, right? And thinking about that, we started to discuss why. Why these calves are different. These calves are um, treated the same. They will have pretty similar genetics. What's going on? These all healthy calves. We remove all the sick animals from here. Is it person? forage intake, genetics, personality difference. And we did that same test and we look at that. Does the personality traits of this that they express actually are associated with how much grain they ate during winning? And we found that very much that association, that is more associations here, we'll not discuss them all, but exploratory camps or the trait of curiosity and exploration in the test was highly, and I will show you some of what I mean, it's highly, highly associated with the calves that ate grain first, uh, increased grain intakes, and obviously intake of uh, solids really is consequential for weight gain of these calves. And we were like, yes, it's nice that we have all this data. Does even the simplest thing, can we go out in a calf ranch or in a calf barn full of calves, do a test at day 24, and is it associated with performance of these calves, especially because we think that we can measure that exact trait. And we find that, we found that in our calf barn, so we had the like very modern UBC calves performing that way. We had the redneck calves of Kentucky, perform similarly and we found the same thing. And then even more important, I was like, what about the poor suckers that are raised individually? Do these calves still in a much barren environment, in a much less, with less chance, let's say, of express some of this behavior? Would we still find that association between personality trait and performance? And we did the same. Again, but we had the modern, very progressive uh, UBC calves. We had our redneck calves in a group house here in Kentucky. And we had even the wolves, right? The poor redneck calves that were inside of uh, intensive nutrition system, uh, individually raised with two buckets. And we wanted to see, is there a relationship between personality and performance? And we get, we got uh, 30 calves that were in a trial. We did both tests, we did personality tests and the isolation box. As I showed the isolation box before, I will show now the, per the personality tests where we did like in their arena, uh, a, novel a novel person test. We also did a novel object with a, a remote control car that is probably like half a meter of size and then when the calves started, it would uh, run across the, the arena. And then that was a start of test. Actually, we have very funny videos uh, of that. It's pretty interesting. And we wanted to see, is there a relationship? And again, we found the same relationship that calves that were more fearful or more less active throughout the test, the one that grow the least, the same thing with grain intake. So there is this big picture of all point at the same direction. The calves that are more explorative, that are move more on the, on the tests are the ones that grows faster, have more grain and milk intake. And even the same thing with the individual calves, that the calves that are, well, more fearful decrease intake and decrease average daily gain, or we can invert, right? Like to make beautiful in the slide, the calves that are less fearful gain more weight and have a higher grain intake. So it's very interesting. 
And I think like, especially we have five papers, you don't put the other two here, the five papers have the same association. If we talk about that idea of repeatability of results, that painted very big history of personal trading curves are highly associated with performance. So it's all good. And then the, you, I hope you guys, you know, and <laughs> Thought about this, like it's oh, we can measure personal trait, and we know that, right? I just want to point out uh, colloquially, I've talked about this with farmers, and we all know that. Like, you talk with farmers that have been working with 20, 30 years with cattle, and they're like, oh, of course, they, they call the fist, right? Like, the calf that really fights in the feed bank is really explorative, that don't care about anything, jumps the fences, are the cow that will be highly productive, that will, you know, be. Uh, very aggressive on the feedback. I don't know if that's what we want, but that's what that personal to trait is. And it's the ones that eat more, produce more. Can we identify that was my question. So we can measure, but can we go there and be beforehand and be, these are the animals that we might be with that personal trait and thus with increased performance. And we did that. We got all these calves, like a 96 calves, again, uh, uh, precision technology, how much they use the brush, how much they ate, the amount they take, milk, uh, everyday uh, health checks, how sick they were. And we wanted to see, can at day 30, we predict who are the calves that we win with higher intake and especially with great average daily gain. So we did that. We did that through machine learning models. We use 20% of these calves to make an algorithm with all the variables that we had, the 89 variables. I think 40 of those were loaded in the end in this KKN machine learning model. And we made that. We made that at day 30, we could divide these calves in three patterns, calves that were feed motivated, calves that were milk driven, and calves that were active. And we found that these calves that especially were described as feed motivated day 30 were the ones that had higher everything. They were the ones that uh, would have increased performance, would eat more grain, and especially would be with a higher total body weight at the end of the trial. And the same thing like those 42 calves, we use, I think, 30 some to develop the yeah. model and 42 to Cheers. test. Oh, sorry, someone stopped. So the only thing and the big limitation, well, and so we could identify those and we can more like that we have even uh, a new data set that we can with more calves that at day 30, we can have a 0 0.69, 0 0.68 association with grain intake and performance at the end of winning. So we can do that. Personality, so the answer is that personality traits are associated with behavior on the daily basis. And with those behaviors on the daily basis, we can predict uh, performance through winning. However, everything that we did, and this was actually a question that I gave, that I had on one of the talks that I gave this year, is that all the thing that you're talking about is on very intensive modern production systems. Because the first question that comes from farmers is, can we go there on day 30 and remove all these low doers right there, right? Should we be selecting the ones at the bottom together with all the variables? But that is like the idea. And my answer has always been no, right? We need the spectrum of personnel. There are different changes that personality traits influence. And the idea here is that everything that we did was in those intensive production systems. And there are many other questions for us now, and we are doing that. Like, how can we, does, should we be treating calves different? Should the calves with different personality traits receive treatments in different ages? Should we have this multi process? And I didn't talk here, but one thing that we did was to look at weaning calves by grain intake, and that is highly influenced by personality and the slow doers, the more fearful are the one that uh, end up winning 20, 25 days later. So should we be talking about that if we have that data? Should different diet, different management, and I think the questions are infinite. 
And I think the biggest question is like, is that something that is influenced by the production system? And we don't have that data, right? Like we can look throughout, no one went there and did with cows and pasture, with low producing cows and see of different challenges. And that I think it's a part of the future. So the use of precision technology of profiling cows is a possibility. We are not there yet, but definitely has a lot of uh, positive data looking for the future. I think we may be using this data to provide support for managerial decisions, especially related to age and transition and stressful events of these animals and a lot of things is in the future and a lot of opportunities for automatization, data management and selection of animals based on that, in my opinion. So I'd like to thank and ask any question, like I work for the University of Kentucky, that's who pay my bills and I need to, you know, uh, respond to that responsibility. And these are some of the sponsors that I thank for the research that we do here. So thank you very much. And I think I'm exactly on 45 minutes. So that was great. That was fantastic. Perfect timing. So if we could have some virtual applause, use your big yellow hands to show Joao how much you enjoyed his talk. Um, and he's kindly advertising our next seminar as well, which is going to be something quite different, a sociological um, approach to uh, pet keeping and companion animals. But before I talk more about that, let's hear some questions from you. So there's two ways to ask questions. One is to pop them in the chat. Another is to put your um, yellow hand up and I will call on you and you can ask Joel um, yourself. And while you gather your thoughts, I do have a question. Um, Joao, you really emphasize the implications of these findings and these technologies for production. And of course that makes sense given your department and given your audience is often farmers and people in the business, but what's the implications for welfare? Can we select for cows that are gonna be happy? So that's a really, really good question, Georgia. I didn't even put here because, you know, uh, we are, it's very pilot data. First, I will start saying that is not a welfare, right? Like welfare level is something much more complex and broad. But could we select, or at least could we identify animals that are more prone to experience high level of stress through challenges in general, regrouping, winning, uh, painful procedures. And we have some preliminary data that I will not say, and we, I am very cautious to say that because the sheep work or the sheep behavior is a class example, right? Doesn't mean that an animal that don't respond is the one that experienced something the least. But there is a high association between response to a stressful procedure in some of these personal traits that are measured. And I think the same way that here I'm talking about performance, because performance is a lot more developed, uh, metric that is easier to, to collect as well, right? The, DMI, dry matter intake is very easy. Like how, how stressful was this for you is not as easy, but I think that, yes. And we know that in rodents, right? And well, <laughs> I'm, here, like I'm talking to the specialists here, but we have a lot of data showing that in the rodents. And I think that translates uh, to cattle as well. Yeah, fantastic. It'd be great to add some cognitive bias tests maybe just to really, yeah, yeah, yeah cool. All right, so we've got some questions. One from Sam who asks, is it fair to compare isolation, the isolation box test and the other novelty tests? Cause they, they just seem such different testing conditions. So that's a very, well, that is the test. <laughs> so that's what we were trying to, to do. Uh, fair, I, I, I'm not saying fair or, non, or unfair. What we wanted to know is that what the, which trait the isolation box was measuring. We knew that it was measuring something, right? It's like, I will not say that it's not stressful. Actually, cattle is very, very much stress uh, when put themselves on a novel environment test and everything. I, again, back, it's hard to say what is more stressful. However, I think that the isolation box test very, is a lot more limiting on what traits it is measuring. 
and we need to you know be aware of that and use that the same thing with the back test on our, on the swine right that is not a complete test but measure a very clear uh, personality trait that is highly associated with performance that's why it's done uh, aggression or sociability all these tests you know none of them or at least that I know of we don't have one at this point that is broad and encompass all the personal traits. We just need to each test, knowing what is measuring and making sure that we condition our discussion and our conclusion to what we are we are measuring. But to be honest, I was very surprised. We started with isolation box test because Megan, my grad student, was really into it. She's like, we need to find something that we could take to calf ranches. We want she wanted and wants to do research of like personal testing in many animals on production setting. And that's why we try to adapt it. And I'm very surprised of how well it has worked for cows. Yeah, lucky, nice. Um, and there's a question from Christine as well, kind of inspired by what we know from humans probably, and also what evolutionary biologists tell us. Do you consider pedigree information in, in your studies? And if so, what does that reveal? Are related animals um, more similar in personality? And also, could that affect your results? I mean, I guess it could lead to maybe artifactual clusters of responding that you might need to, you might need to control for pedigree. So it's actually, so Christina, Christine, mm -hmm. it's a very good question because this was one of the things that inspired us to do that, right? Because the dairy industry doesn't have a classic uh, personality or temperament test that is, we have, but it is non reliable whatsoever, right? Milk and temperament and others, and I'm sure you know that better than anybody. And it's funny because the answer for that we consider, but is, and I had this discussion, especially with Mike Stilda in Guelph, that is such a good scientist. And one day we are discussing this, and because of this test, knowing the pedigree, especially the bulls. Uh, that were used, the sires that were used in these animals is clear. Got to a point that we knew some of the bulls by name because their calves were so uh, wary or so tame, right? So those sires. So yes, it influenced, we did consider, but you know, such a small uh, sample size, but with almost the opposite. If we have enough good tests, I think that information could go back to selection and then be used to actually select for uh, for temperament or personality traits the way that we, that we want. Right, great. Uh, Christine, does that answer your question? I think it probably does. Sure, we should talk to Joao. Brilliant. Mike, you got named there. Have you got any questions for Joao if you're there? Hopefully not. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Oh, great, interesting question from as Vasil Koizi. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, Joao, have you um, looked at disease susceptibility to see if that's predicted by personality? So that is a very good question and we didn't, we thought about that. We did a power analysis and we need something like 600 calves by the prevalence that we have. So we need better sponsors of research than we have now. But one thing that we have and we are investigating is actually the opposite. Does the animals that get sick and how they behave throughout the bout of sickness actually is associated with personality? And that's that is very in the core of our interest because one thing that we do a lot is develop models of disease detection, right? Based on precision technology data. And there is this crazy amount of individual variants. That's why the algorithm, you know, more individual variants, you have uh, worse is your algorithm to detect anything. So if we can explain some of that difference, some of that variation, we have bad algorithms. Does we think that if we can explain or at least consider some of these expected behavioral patterns based on personal traits or based on even daily personal, uh, daily patterns, and how they will behave throughout the disease, we could have better algorithms. And we are investigating that. And yes, as a high association, especially between the exploratory traits and how much 
like that animal will show sickness behavior, especially on movement, line bouts, and things like that. Mm -hmm. But to just now talking about literature in other research, in other animals, we have a lot of it, right? Like even in humans showing some, some of that and we don't know what comes first, right? If it is the disease bout that affect your, uh, your behavior and your personal trait, or if it's your personal trait that end up making you more su susceptible to some of those diseases. Right. Cool, fantastic. Okay, we have a satisfied answer there. Um, a question from Emma Nip. Hi, Emma. Um, do you think these personality tests could also predict sort of inter animal relationships in a herd? So things like aggression, sociability, and other, other aspects of relationship hierarchy, for example. So that's a, a very, very good question, especially UBC, like Nina and well, with her students have investigated a lot with sociability and they found a lot of very interesting uh, association. So Le Corp is the name of the grad student, the surname of the grad student that has some very interesting uh, relationship of that. Actually, sociability is a personal trait, right? Just like to put that is not that is associated with, it's a personal trait itself, but it's highly associated uh, throughout the life and with a lot of the managerial decisions, uh, managerial management that we do with these animals. So they found some very interesting relationship. Aggression is a, is a little bit trickier. We, we look at it and we never, that's why it's not published anywhere because we, we suffer of the negative bias, right? That if you don't find any results end up like dying on, on my Gmail, but we try to look at aggression in some of these trials and we never found any association with the factors that we extracted in the personal traits that we have uh, been able to measure. So I'm not saying that there is no relationship Probably it's like we need to improve the test that we do to find that trait that is associated with aggression, right? So I think that's what happened. One thing that I that are very interesting paper from I think it's Denmark, I think it's from the Aarhus group, looking at it throughout time and especially I think came from the swine because they did with swine first because they wanted to find uh, sows that were less aggressive in the in the group housing. And there are some associations there that they could measure in some of the tests and how they would be, a, you know, which position they would be in the hierarchy of the group and then how much aggression they would be. So aggressive they would be. And that, I think that's very interesting, but not from our research, but it's like super, as you mentioned, uh, super mood facet. And that's like, that's a problem, right? Like that we are still, trying to make like something very broad, cut a piece of the pie and get that piece of the pie to see how that is associated with some very specific metric. Mm -hmm. We are not looking at the holistic point to be, you know what I mean? Almost making uh, a complex personality profile and then trying to fit that animal into the managerial decision. We are you know, a lot more cavemen than that, right? Like that's the, that's the idea. And a follow-up question from Lena. She's wondering, is the issue that aggression is so multifaceted? And so for example, in dogs, we know that there's different forms of aggression and you can imagine different motivators for aggression as well. I think so. I yeah. think so, I agree completely. And especially normally on the dairy side, the aggression is always associated with a limited resource. So I think there is a lot of association of the motivation that you have associated to that resource yeah. with, so it's not just personal, right? If you are a cow that is very food motivated, you have more aggression there, your hierarchy point, what, you know what I mean? So many things goes on. So I think yeah. that's the problem. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All righty, so any more questions? Going once, going twice going three times. All right, I think you have satisfied everyone's curiosity, no matter what their personality then. That's fantastic. So for those of you in the audience, if you enjoyed this talk and want to hear it again, it will be posted on the Seesaw YouTube channel. If you have a friend who missed it, 
please let them know. It will be posted. The recording will be up there on YouTube. If you want to um, keep on following um, Campbell Center events, then you've got two options. Email me to go on the listserv or follow us on Twitter, whichever is your preference. Um, the next research seminar, as I mentioned, will be Jennifer Applebaum at the end of March, talking about a sociological approach to companion animal keeping. Uh, Michelle has just put the Seesaw Twitter feed up on chat if anyone wants to see it. We also have an Indigenous Perspectives on Animal Use talk coming up in the middle of February. Uh, we're still finessing the date, but like I say, get on the listserv or follow us on Twitter to keep um, on track. And I'll look forward to seeing you all at other meetings. Last but not least, Joelle, thank you so much. That was such a wonderful presentation and I'd loved your answers to the questions too. So thanks again.